Hey there, and welcome to the first lecture for anatomy and physiology for this week. Um, in this lecture, I'll talk about some common themes in anatomy and physiology. These are things that will come up over and over again this semester and next semester. So some of these I'll talk about in more detail in a lecture either later this week or next week. Some I'll kind of briefly mention to you and you'll see again, just kind of putting things into context of what is anatomy and physiology and what things um, are important to think about when we're getting into the details of molecules and cells, um, thinking about what the common themes are is really helpful for understanding the big picture. So let's get to it. Maybe. Okay. Here are some of the themes. So structure, function. Um, structure is anatomy. So the structures that make something up. Um, this is really important for understanding how things work, right? What is the structure? What does it look like? What are the shapes? Where are the holes? Where are the tubes? Um, so this is your anatomy. And this we'll do a lot of in lab. And this relates very closely to function. The structure of something is going to determine the function of it. And this is a common theme that we see in anatomy and physiology from the level of molecules and proteins all the way to the level of the organism, um, right? Someone with short legs, a different gait is going to have a different, um, sorry, someone with short legs could have a different gait, a different function than someone with longer legs. So structure, function, relationships. Um, and this is going to be at all levels of organization. So by levels of organization, I mean from the molecule all the way up to the organism. And I have a separate lecture that will talk more about these two things in detail um, and go through this in a, a little bit more. But for now, um, let's see, I lost my... There we go. Here's my structure function example for now. Um, so the heart has certain chambers, certain valves, actually very complex, and that determines how the blood is gonna flow through it, where pressures are high and low, um, and that's this bottom line here. So which valves are open and closed, and then how blood is able to not only flow through the heart, but out of the heart, which is pretty important. So the structure of the heart is determining and very closely related to its function and we need to understand them both to fully understand how it works. So that's anatomy and physiology. Levels of organization, that's everything from atom. Um, we typically start at the molecule level, but we'll talk about some atoms, um, all the way up to a multicellular organism. In our case, primarily humans. But these different levels, um, I'll talk more about them in another lecture, are gonna be important to keep in mind and that we're looking at all of them. So we're going to study all of them, not just like the organ systems, kind of what you think of as anatomy and physiology maybe. Um, in order to understand an organ system, we have to know how organ systems work together. That's the integration of organ systems, um, and that's going to make the whole organism function. So I'll give some examples of that, but for example, the nervous system regulates the muscular system to allow muscles to contract. Can't do it alone. Um, but also we need to look at cells. So we can't understand how an organ functions or an organism functions without looking at the cells that make it up. I'll talk more about that. Um, integration of organ systems I just mentioned, I will again in just a moment, they work together. Um, and then we've got homeostasis. So that is um, maintaining an internal environment that's constant um, and that it be able to regulate internal environment. So these are just a couple of the themes. I have a few more in a moment. But I want to talk a little bit more about these last two here. So these are your organ systems that you probably have seen before. Um, we'll be learning these a little bit more in lab, um, but I do want you, we're not going to be learning all of these this semester in detail, but you need to know them all. So you need to go ahead and learn your organ systems. What are the names of them? And what is the basic function of each? Um, and some of these have individual functions that you probably know already, right? Respiratory system exchanges gases with the environment. Digestive system takes up nutrients and excretes waste. The nervous and endocrine systems coordinate body functions. However, like I mentioned before, organ systems communicate with each other. So the nervous and endocrine are communicating with 
everything, um, but also others. So the urinary system regulates blood pressure because the urinary system is going to regulate urine output, huge in blood pressure regulation. This affects then the cardiovascular system. And then these organ systems are all going to work together to maintain homeostasis. So the conditions in the environment are constantly changing. I've got a whole lecture series on homeostasis next week, but at least do want to, to mention it. Um, now, it's, it's gonna be huge. So organisms either need to be able to conform to their external environment or regulate their external environment. In reality, we all do some of each. Um, humans do a lot of regulation. Um, so for example, blood pressure regulation, um, and that's done by cardiovascular, urinary, digestive, and nervous system. Um, so here, I got one example here before we go to the next slide on this integration idea. So this is the integration of digestive system, cardiovascular, urinary, and respiratory. So these are, the digestive is gonna take in nutrients, break them down, and then eliminate unwanted matter. The nutrients are gonna be taken up into the bloodstream to be um, shuttled around the body, right? So we've got the cardiovascular that is distributing those nutrients as well as wastes um, throughout the body. The cardiovascular system is also distributing gases that are obtained from the respiratory system. And then the urinary system is putting out those wastes and not just ones that came from the digestive system, but ones that come from the rest of the body, as well as actually from the respiratory system as well. So a lot of pH regulation um, happens in the, at the urinary system. So the idea here is just a visual example I'm sorry, there's one more system here as well. The integumentary system is this surrounding skin, right, is what integumentary is, that's protecting this whole set of systems from the external environment. Um, really cool, right, that how just this simple example right here, not super simple, but basic example um, of five different systems working together right here. Endocrine and nervous are kind of controlling all these processes. So just a visual of this integration between different organ systems. Um, and these all, all these organ systems need to work together to maintain homeostasis. So this is working, this is great, but let's say you go out and you start sweating a whole lot, um, or you start exercising a whole lot, you start sweating. So you've got um, to regulate your, your blood volume, the urinary system, your integumentary system starts kicking into sweat, um, you have to maintain a reasonable temperature. So that's where these homeostatic processes come in. Um, all these organ systems are constantly working to maintain homeostasis while still responding to changes in demands. So exercise or hot versus really cold weather, right? We live in Wisconsin. Um, so here's an actual example of that homeostasis and those regulated variables, which are things that we need to regulate. So temperature. If our body temperature gets to 105 degrees, our brains don't do so well. Hypothermia can occur if we get too cold. So body temperature is an example of a regulated variable. So you can think of some more regulated variables. So when I do that, you can pause the video, and I think it's really good for you to be able to try to name some yourself. So body temperature is one I just said. Blood pressure, I've said before, blood glucose, so sugar levels in your body. You know how hangry you can get if you don't eat. Um, or too high glucose as well can cause problems. Blood pH is another one that's really important because um, a altered pH can change the shape of your proteins and then your proteins don't work and that's bad. So homeostasis refers to the maintenance in a range of um, in all environmental conditions. Internal conditions are maintained in a narrow range despite the outside changing. So homeostasis literally means unchanging, but in reality, our, we've actually learned a lot that our bodies do change more than we think. It's a dynamic state. Um, we'll go into this more next week. But for now, I do want to show you this one graphic here that kind of gets at the idea of these regulated variables and what they look like in terms of a graphic. So this is showing temperature, so body temperature, and body temperature is typically about 30 degrees Celsius. This would be 98 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's what's said to be the, the set point. Um, and that's on average, your average person. 
actually variable though between people, different times of the month, different conditions. When you exercise, you actually do increase your body temperature. But then even just at rest, there's oscillations. So that's what this is showing here. These oscillations are up and down above that set point. So there's actually a range around the set point of normal functioning. Those are the oscillations. And this is pretty much true for all regulated variables. There'll be different ranges for different variables, depending on kind of how important it is to regulate them um, really carefully. And then one variable is not all that matters, right? So like, let's say you're running really hard in the heat. You need to regulate body temperature. Um, it's going to increase your metabolism, right? Because you need to regulate your glucose. So in order to produce more ATP via glucose, you need to increase metabolism. That's going to increase temperature. Now you need to regulate that. You're going to sweat. Um, you know, when you're sweating, now you have to regulate blood volume. So that's how the organ systems work together. Um, just think while we have this here, what about heart rate? Do you think that's a regulated variable? It's actually not. So it's designed to change quickly in order to maintain blood flow to the body. Of course, there is a heart rate that's too low and heart rate that's too high, but it is, um, it's not designed to be regulated. It is designed to dynamically change to meet body needs. Unlike body temperature, which the goal of the body is to maintain a certain temperature. So that's homeostasis. Um, we, going back to the structure function idea, one thing I want to point out, and another theme in biology, uh, in anatomy and physiology, is comparative anatomy. So we talked about how structures determine functions. Um, one way we can look at that and learn about that is to compare humans to other organisms. And that's what we do in some in labs, right? We even look at rats sometimes because they have the same organs and organ systems. Um, this is an example of structure of function, right? We have similar structure, bone structures in the feet of chimpanzee and humans, but they're also slightly different. So by comparing the structures, we can learn about, um, first of all, our evolutionary history, um, what adaptations have occurred in, in humans, bipedalism is huge. So when we went to two legs from four, a lot of changes in anatomy occurred to allow that to happen. Um, so that is comparative anatomy and then also comparative physiology um, that will come up a little bit. And so evolution is just key to how we are. Um, so it will, it will come up a little bit as a theme throughout this course. Along with that, there's also biological variation. So oftentimes when we talk about anatomy, I'll show you a picture of an average person that's often 150 pound male. That's kind of what's been studied the most often, average size, usually Caucasian male. Um, in reality, there's a lot of biological variation in all species, humans included. Um, they're just in different body shapes here. Obviously, there's, that doesn't even encompass all the variation of all different body sizes, hair colors, skin colors, inside, even um, you know, different organ setups to the extreme. Variation is something that we won't focus a lot on, but um, just remember that it exists. Okay, so we have gone through, still not, oh, there we go. Um, some of these already, we talked about these a bit, most of these I'll have a separate lecture on as well. We talked about evolution and comparative anatomy, physiology, just briefly, just as kind of a theme that will come back. Biological variation. Um, I have, I believe, one more. So gradients and flow. So this is a huge important concept in anatomy and physiology where it's talking about the drive, what makes something happen. Um, so the simple example of this kind of put in context is the tendency of something to go down naturally versus up is takes work. Um, so this would be down a gradient where there is this flow of energy um, going down a hill. That's called down a gradient. There's drive this direction. When you go up a gradient, that takes work. That's going to take ATP, um, and that's called against or up the gradient. And there's, so there's not drive for that naturally. So let's have some examples of this um, right now. Again, this is something you will see 
a million times in every organ system. Um, this is how our bodies work. So here's again that general example, just the down a gradient, up a gradient. Down means it's gonna happen spontaneously, it's with the flow, downhill. Downhill, you actually see that as well. Um, some examples of that are blood pressure. So blood flow throughout our bodies is due to the heart pumping and that heart contraction is a high pressure, creates high pressure. So high pressure at the heart is going to cause blood to flow away from the heart to the rest of the body. It returns to the heart just because there's still that pressure there. And that's why low blood pressure can be a problem. Um, you need that blood to return to your heart where it can be pumped again. So it's a high to low pressure, similar to a tap, a water tap. So that is liquid flow, um, it's pressure. Same idea would be with air pressure as well. This is a chemical gradient. So if you have high glucose, on one side of a membrane, this might be in the lumen or the inside of the intestine, um, and you have lower glucose inside the cell, glucose is going to flow in down its gradient. Now this is separate from the fact of it needs, it might need a protein or something to help it get into the cell. We'll get into membranes and the structure of membranes um, the week after next. But this is just saying there is a drive. This is a down, gradient um, to move into the cell from high to low glucose concentration. And that is a chemical gradient because glucose is a chemical. It's a molecule. It's a physical substance. This is also called a concentration gradient. Here we've got an electrical gradient. This will be really important when we talk about um, neurons especially as well as muscles. So if you've got a positive charge outside and negative charge inside, that positive is gonna be pulled inside from positive to negative charge. Other way of thinking of that is, is there's more positives out here, fewer positives in here. In reality for ion flow, it's going battery positive and negative, or magnets positive and negative are attracted to each other. So that is an electrical gradient. This is flowing downhill, down the gradient, um, it's gonna happen spontaneously. And we'll talk about what happens when you need something to move up the gradient, right? That's gonna be really important. We do have things move up gradients all the time. They need to, but it's gonna take work, ATP. Last example here is heat. So heat loss, right? And you know this from going out in the winter without a jacket, um, heat dissipates. Um, this actually happened, this is what's happening here, right? So this is the bloodstream and heat is um, flows out of the body. We lose heat, this happens especially in water. You know, if you're a swimmer, you get um, cold in the water more quickly because that um, water actually sucks away that heat even quicker than air does. Either way, the idea is there is a gradient, warm to cold, um, that thermal gradient. Um, this one won't come up quite as much in, in this semester, but um, the idea of gradients as being a drive for flow, and then the idea that we have to move against those gradients sometimes is really important and will come up again. Okay, so these are the learning outcomes I covered in this um, mini lecture here. So the main themes in anatomy and physiology, describe those themes, and they basically listed here what those themes were. Define homeostasis and explain why this concept is central to physiology. We'll talk a little bit more about homeostasis. Um, I will talk about that more also next week. These are some of the terms for homeostasis down here at the bottom that I want you to know. Again, will be reviewed next week. And then define gradient, provide an example of gradients in human physiology. So these are the terms for that here, and the th kind of three of the examples I talked about. So I am going to post these learning outcomes on the learning outcome page, so you can refer to them there as well. Um, and please let me know if you have any questions.